The system is broken. The political system, the way we are organized politically on this island is broken. We've allowed this Puerto Rican elite class that's mostly white, mostly male, mostly privileged to kind of run this country into the ground for the last 40 years. Hello, and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. You know, occasionally um, there'll be a protest somewhere in the world that will break through to American news consumption. And American news consumption tends to be pretty America domestic focused generally. When you go to other places in the world, they tend to spend a lot more time on other places in the world, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But putting that aside, you will see uh, like a Hong Kong protest, for instance, protest videos, people in the streets. And it's always sort of remarkable to watch people assemble in mass numbers um, to take to the streets demanding political change. You know, you'll see the images in the case of Hong Kong, you know, people with umbrellas, hundreds of thousands in the streets, people with sort of masks over their face breaking into the legislature. And you just are completely ill-equipped with the context <laughs> to understand what, like, wow, they are really angry and organized and there's a lot of them. And so then you, may, you know, go read an article in the news about the extradition uh, legislation that's been proposed that would essentially allow um, those in Hong Kong to be extradited back to the Chinese mainland. And this is true of Tahrir Square. It's true of all kinds of protests. You see the Maidan uh, in, in Ukraine uh, a few years ago during uh, various color revolutions. Well, we've, we've got one of those in the U.S., it's not a foreign story. There's we, one of those happened this last week in the U.S. in the American territory. Some would say my next guest would say colony of Puerto Rico. Uh, in Puerto Rico, hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets through sustained protest for 12, 13, 14 days, somewhere around there, demanding the resignation of Ricardo Rosselló, who is the governor of Puerto Rico. That's what the chief executive of that territory, colony, commonwealth is called, the governor. And for a while he was trying to not resign, but then eventually he did. And I probably like you, I, you know, I follow, I read a lot of newspaper articles every day. I probably read literally hundreds. I follow the news extremely closely. And I had some idea of what what was going on in Puerto Rico. But as I saw these images, as I saw people in my Twitter feed, because I, I follow some people in, from Puerto Rico on, in, on Twitter, um, as I saw people I know who are either of Puerto Rican extraction or have Puerto Rican loved ones tweeting about it, I got more and more curious about, OK, well, I, I get that people view this guy as corrupt, but like, what what's going on here? What is going on here? And wanted to do a podcast about it. And this is said podcast. So today we're going to talk to Julio Ricardo Varela. Julio is born in Puerto Rico, uh, grew up between Puerto Rico and the States, as you will hear. He's a journalist. He's co-host of the podcast In the Thick. He's founder of a great media organization called Latino Rebels. Both are part of Futuro Media. So he and Maria Inoosa, who you may know, who has been on my program both on the weekends on, and on All In, they do a ton of reporting on Latinx issues, not just things like Puerto Rico or migration, but the full panoply. And they do an incredible work. And Julio is just a really, like, kind of amazing, knowledgeable guy. And one of our producers saw that he was writing a lot about this. And so we reached out to him sort of at the last minute to say, like, let's let's do a quick like on the news cycle podcast about what the hell is going on. Now, I should note for the timing, this intro is being recorded on Friday, July 26th. The interview was on Wednesday, July 24th in the afternoon. And as I was speaking to him, everything was on a knife's edge and there was widespread anticipation that Rosselló would resign. But he had not yet. In fact, Julio and I were checking our phones during the conversation. The Speaker of the House of Puerto Rico had issued a, a warning basically saying, look, if you don't resign, we will initiate impeachment hearings. And then that night, maybe four or five hours after we recorded, he did, in fact, resign. So know that we are speaking with the specter of his resignation hanging over the entire conversation. But it hasn't happened yet. But it will. It has happened now that you're listening to this to understand where you are in the sort of time frame of this whole thing. If you are curious for some backstory as well, we did a podcast with Naomi Klein last year about Puerto Rico, Maria, and the and Promesa, the sort of fiscal oversight board, which you will hear about in this conversation as well. So if you like this conversation and you want even more sort of in-depth discussion of the finances and the sort of austerity regime over Puerto Rico, you can check that out. But I have to say, I thought I knew a fair amount about Puerto Rico, but this conversation 
just show me how little I know about my fellow American citizens on the island of Puerto Rico. Right now, you and I are talking, and it is Wednesday, July 24th. And as we're having this conversation, there's sort of this, everyone's on tenterhooks in Puerto Rico yep. about whether the governor, uh, Ricardo Rosseo, is going to resign, right? Right. So I want to talk about the protests and Rosseo, but I guess I want to just back like way up <laughs> on this first. Yeah, sounds good. Just to, So first, tell me about your, your yourself. Are you, you're Puerto Rican by familial extraction, although you weren't born there, you were born here. No, right? no, I was born there. Oh, you No, were? no, I'm born in, yeah, yeah. My, uh, y- you'll love this story. My, uh, my parents met in the 60s. Um, I was born in Atorre, Puerto Rico. In 1969, I'm not, I will say it, I have no problem. It's, you know, the year of the moon landing when the Mets won. <laughs> and I'm not a Mets fan. The two but most another... important accomplishments for humanity in that year. Exactly. Like, so I'm kind of like, this is kind of the year, right? Yeah. So um, my dad is Puerto Rican and my mom is Bronx Italian. Oh, wow. And she came down there and uh, I was born and raised there. And then when my folks split when I was seven, I moved to the Bronx. But then I would always spend my summers... And my uh, Christmases and holidays in Puerto Rico. And I have tons of cousins. And I actually went back after I graduated. I worked there for a year. Puerto Rico has always been part of me. And I mean, I grew up speaking Spanish and English. I'm a native Spanish speaker, bilingual. Okay, so you so you you grew up in this sort of milieu. I mean, it's familiar, I think, to folks, particularly in the Bronx, where there's a huge yeah. Puerto Rican population, and like living in the Bronx and going to Puerto Rico for the summer is a is a real common thing, right? Like go, yeah, see, it's a badge of honor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, people have been seeing these pictures of these incredible protests. I yeah. think they have a vague sense of Ricardo Rosseo because of his sitting next to Donald Trump and sort of meekly telling him that only 17 people had died in Hurricane Maria yes. when that was off by about 3,000 uh, people. Yeah. But before we get to that, before we get to Maria or Roseo, maybe let's just start with, like, the status of Puerto Rico before mm. all this. As the, You know what I mean? As the, as the kind of, like, baseline context and condition for what's happening on the island now. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things, Chris, that I'm trying to bring into the conversation I've been doing a lot is that it's okay to call Puerto Rico a colony as a journalist. And, you know, you know, people say it's a U.S. territory. It's part of the United States. We're American citizens. We're colonial possession. And if we really want to break it down, uh, we're actually celebrating um, July 25th is the anniversary of the invasion of Puerto Rico in 1898 um, during the Spanish-American War, which for anyone who knows that time, America was uh, America was into imperialism. Yes, this and is kind of the peak peak imperial <laughs> yeah, moment, right? Yeah, the, Phil- it's peak the, Phil- guilt- the Philippines <laughs> and the Caribbean are the sort of the, the South Pacific and and the Caribbean are the two places when America at its sort of like imperial apex in a, in right. a classic traditional sense, not in a kind of more postmodern sense, but like in the exactly. straight up old like we are taking your island. <laughs> way. Yeah, exactly. And what's funny is that, you know, Cuba was there and Puerto Rico was kind of like an afterthought, right? At the end, like all of a sudden, like they invade Puerto Rico and like, like the Spanish American war is over. And next thing you know, there's like Puerto Rican flags and, you know, the Spanish have been taken away and we're territory. And you see the, you see the cartoons, you know, of our uncle Sam with the, you know, the natives and, you know, just such offensive, you know, things that you would never think, you know, that we would see now. They were just so incredibly uh, imperialistic, you know, end of the Gilded Age, Teddy Roosevelt, because there was sugar. It was all about sugar. And you have these sugar barons that literally took over Puerto Rico. And, you know, this agricultural island became a sugar baron empire. So all those people, you know, when you hear like Domino sugar and all that, you know, with your coffee or <laughs> like that has a history. There was a hurricane around the time as well that kind of just destroyed Puerto Rico. And next thing you know, you have all these, you know, we're a protectorate. You have these governors showing up by the start of World War One. We are, we're American citizens. There's an act. Um, a lot of people would say that it's imposed, although history can say, you know, there were, you know, when it comes to colonialism, Chris, there's people that have always rejected it. And then there's people who are like, Oh, the Americans are here. Let me be friends. You right. Know what I mean, I, mean? So, that, I think you know that, what I'm saying? yeah, well, I think part of what makes it complicated, right, is that 
there's a question of like, what do the Puerto Rican people want? And there's these sort of three options, right? There's like statehood, independence, and and some yeah. permutation of the protectorate territory <laughs> status. Whatever. And in right. a weird way, like my interpretation always is that you can't really marshal a strong majority for either of the statehood or independence. And so what you get is the continuation of the status quo over decades and decades. But maybe that's overly simplified. No, I think you're right. I mean, first of all, I think when we fast forward, you know, you got to look at Puerto Rico in the Cold War in sort of the World War II early Cold War context as well. And start thinking about the nationalist movement that happened in the 30s and the 40s. And there was a big politician. His name is Luis Munoz Marin, who was kind of, you know, the grandfather of of the Commonwealth. Estado Libre Asociado, free, you know, that it, it's known as ELA. But basically, the best translation is uh, Commonwealth. He started as a nationalist. And then, you know, there was another nationalist leader called Pedro Albizu Campos, who was kind of much more radical I'm trying to use terms that people understand now because right. I think nationalism in the 30s and the 40s had a much different um, context, especially when you look at the British Empire and places right. like that. You know, Chris, there was a big movement of like, colonialism sucks, let's fight it. And Puerto Rico had that movement. But I think in the context of the United States, after World War II, Puerto Rico kind of became sort of this um, strategic place, especially when you start moving into the Cuban Revolution in 1959. Puerto Rico started having more interest in the United States sort of geopolitical game. And Luis Munoz Marin kind of saw, he was pretty savvy. He kind of saw the United States as sort of a place where it could turn an agrarian society in Puerto Rico into a more modern economy. And in the 30s and the 40s and in the early 50s, you know, his he created the Partido Popular, which is the popular party, which is known as the Commonwealth Party. And I'll never forget, you know, growing up, in Puerto Rico, I don't know if you've ever seen it, Chris. You probably have. I mean, you, you're you down with the Bronx. <laughs> it's sort of that red, you know, the guy, he looks like a peasant and he has a hat, a straw hat. And mm-hmm. it says like, pan, libertad y tierra, yep. which is basically like uh, bread, freedom and land. And what's so funny, and what's interesting is that the first part of that political slogan is bread. So Luis Munoz Marin, you know, basically was sort of like, you know, I'm going to feed my people. And at the same time, Operation Bootstrap was happening. There was a lot of need for cheap labor. What's what's Operation Bootstrap? uh, Operation Bootstrap was this sort of uh, movement that would send labor to the United States, mostly in textile mills. Like, that's why there's a lot of Puerto Ricans in the Northeast in Mm. a lot of ways. Mm. Like, Like, if you look at places like Lowell, Massachusetts, you know, when people say, like, why are there so many Puerto Ricans in Western Massachusetts? It's like... Well, if you think about the story of mill towns right. in Massachusetts, people needed cheap labor. There was a lot going on. And as simple as it could be, the nationalist movement in Puerto Rico also caught the interest of J. Edgar Hoover and FBI and the U.S. government and the rise of communism. And, you know, Munoz Marin was kind of like the moderate dude who was like, I'll, I'll get my people together. Let's create the Commonwealth. Let's, let's not call it a col- colony. Let's call it a free associated state. Estadio Libre Asociado were kind of part of the United States, but were not. And then at the same time, there was a there was a nationalist uprising. There were suppressions of nationalists in, in the 50s. I don't know if people remember the assassination, you know, the, the shooting in the Capitol in the early 50s where Puerto Rican nationalists and Puerto Rican nationalists at the time were kind of, um, how do I put it now? Like al-Qaeda terrorists, if you look at like American journalism in the 50s. It's like, you know, radical Puerto Rican nationalists have taken over the Capitol and also made like uh, assassination attempts on um, Harry Truman. So wait, they made an assassination attempt on Harry Truman? Yeah, it was at the Blair House. Yeah. So I think the, it was like the, the White, White House. House. Yeah. And there was an attempt on his life by Puerto Rican nationalists. So there's this notion of them being these radicals, but there's a history of repression against nationalists in Puerto Rico who were trying to be like, we need to be an independent country. We need to fight colonialism. And sort of this grand bargain with Luis Munoz Marin in the United States was sort of like the safe thing. Right. So you've got, f- you've got the sort of U.S. invades, takes over the Spanish-American War, yeah. gets it as a sort of territory, colonial territory, turns yeah. Puerto Ricans into citizens through law in the, in the teens, right? And then yeah. in the mid-century, uh, Marin sort of strikes what will be the kind of deal, the kind of yeah. liminal space that Puerto Rico will go on to occupy. But there are always largely leftist, right? Like leftist yes. 
revolutionary nationalists, both nonviolent and violent. I mean, quite violent. Um, yeah, they, who yeah. Ag- who are agitating for the the straight up throwing off the colonial shackles, independence. Right, and that continues, and that's why you see like a you know nationalist movement in places like New York and Chicago as you move from the fifties and the sixties and the seventies. But what happened? There are two things I want to bring up about sort of why this started happening, and I think why Munoz Marin sort of became sort of a darling in the eyes of you know the Eisenhowers and JFK. There's a great picture. I actually have it in my house of JFK and Luis Munoz Marin, like in the White House. But you got to think about the Cold War, right? So Cuba comes 1959, and all of a sudden Puerto Rico is a strategic value to the fight against communism in the Caribbean. And you start seeing sort of this push of, you know, Puerto Rico is a place for business, you know, tourism. It's not Cuba. Uh, you know, oh, we just happen to have this island near Cuba. Right. You know, there's military bases. You know, there's you know, there's there's a military presence because Puerto Ricans actually, because they're American citizens, they fight in the armed forces. But there is a military presence on the island, and and it continues. And then you start getting into the '60s, where the radicalization, you know, the Black Power, Chicano Power, the Young Lords. Um, you start looking at. People like Oscar Lopez Rivera with the FALN, which was a militant Puerto Rican nationalist group. And they, you know, if people who grew up in New York City at the time remember that they uh, placed bombs. And Oscar Lopez Rivera was one of the masterminds, although he was never, he was, he was charged with seditious conspiracy, which is, I find fascinating. <laughs> it's something that, you know, the United States uses for uh, its political enemies. So, I mean, I guess the context here that I think is important is like when you're talking about Oscar Lopez Rivera and the sort of militant and, yeah. and violent nationalist movement and permutations of that, particularly in the 60s and 70s, it's in the context of like the PLO, the IRA, like exactly. var- various post-colonial independent nationalistic movements of the militant left that are right. around the world, all of which are essentially staking a claim to self-determination and independence against uh, what they view as colonial occupation. Right. But then on the island, because of Cuba, I don't think people realize there was a lot of Cuban exiles. They, don't, they didn't all go to Miami. Right. Um, they went to San Juan. And, you know, you start seeing sort of a more conservative, you know, Puerto Rico is very conservative and Catholic to begin with. But I think there was starting to be more of a reactionary, like, we are not the left. And you start seeing the early roots of a pro-statehood party. Ferre, Luis Ferre, who's a, who's a Repub- Republican, founded the pro-statehood party, uh, which was basically a party that supported statehood for the United States and was the political opponent of the Luis Munoz Marin Popular Commonwealth Party, which I kind of tend to call, you know, the status quo party right now. And so that started happening. And what's really fascinating about this, as as you start looking into the 70s and the early 80s, Gerald Ford <laughs> was talking about statehood for Puerto Rico right. when he was president. Ronald Reagan was talking about statehood for Puerto Rico. It became part of the Republican platform. Right. So you get you have a basically a, a sort of status quo Commonwealth Party, which essentially is kind of aligned with the Democratic Party, sort of. And then kind of. Yeah. And then the Republican alternative, which is a full statehood party, which is the conservative position. And then sort of off the edge of the kind of like two main parties are the nationalist revolutionaries. Like that's basically right. the sort of three lanes of the politics. Right. The other thing you have to add to this, Chris, is because the push for industrialization, because the push for like companies coming, mostly pharmaceutical companies in like the 60s and the 70s in Puerto Rico, things were good. You know, I grew up in the 70s and in the 80s in Puerto Rico as a kid. Um, I don't want to say it was like the 50s Americana, but it, there's a lot of nostalgia for that time. Mm. It was kind of where we were kind of, you know... The suburban life of Puerto Rico was definitely very Americanized and you kind of still felt Puerto Rican, but it was getting more commercialized. I just remember, you know, when MTV showed up on cable and I was like 12 and I was like, wow, (laughs) you know what I mean? It's like we were starting to be sort of like the the kids of an American like 70s and 80s pop culture. Right. That was sort of brewing at the same time. And 
because of these uh, tax breaks called Section 936, it was basically giving mostly pharmaceutical companies, but other American companies to come to the island, set up shop, get a tax break and create jobs. And there's a lot of friends of mine and their dads like and their moms like they had good jobs. Right. I mean, you've got essentially the establishment of the island negotiating this weird liminal territorial status in ways <laughs> that will yeah. create win-wins for like American capital and Puerto Ricans, essentially, right? I mean, the, the idea is, yes. you know, Puerto Rican elite. Yeah. We, we can we can create inducements. We have a pool of cheaper labor than in the States. We've got this territory that we have a weird relationship with, but is a bulwark against, I don't know, like the Marxists on Cuba and the Soviets. So <laughs> exactly. like, and we'll create these kind of, you know, this special deals where you can go down and pharmaceutical companies and others and get tax inducements to open. And that was at least at the ground level for sort of the middle class building of Puerto Rico, you're saying was like a fairly effective, if not necessarily like redistributively just, but fairly effective as economic stimulus on the island. Yeah. And, and obviously as with any development, this is where sort of the problems start happening because there is sort of a political elite class that I would argue that is really more, you know, San Juan based, privileged, you know, middle class, upper class. Like that's kind of who ruled, who has been ruling Puerto Rico for for decades. And this is where you start seeing the beginnings of the problems and the problems being that, OK, we're starting to maintain this. We have this industry, you know, we have tourism and we want to provide services. Let's start borrowing money. It was a very easy way to maintain these services because Wall Street and financial firms were like, yeah, here's some bonds. Go for it. Puerto Rican bonds are great. And they just kept buying and, you know, raising their debt load and everything's good. And because we have all these companies and then the mid 90s come around and you remember the grand bargain between Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton. Yeah, I mean, I right. remember that they they had a bunch of budget fights. Some resulted in shutdowns, and they struck a series of budget deals. So one of the biggest budget deals was the elimination over the course of ten years the Section nine thirty six the tax break. So part of wow. the big grand bar yeah part of the big grand bargain between Clinton and Gingrich was we got to phase these out. So this is probably nineteen ninety six. So if you start thinking about it, Puerto Rico is borrowing a lot of money. You know, oh, there's just happens to be like corruption as well, because this is all tied to what's happening now. Pedro Rosselló, who's Ricardo Rosselló's dad, was governor of Puerto Rico in the mid 90s, in the early 2000s. So, <laughs> you know, if you look at his history, there's like 40 people that got, I don't know, it's countless. I, I don't know, I don't know the exact number, but there's like a lot of people in his administration got arrested for, you know, corruption charges. Wow. So there's sort of this culture of, in Puerto Rico of where's my piece of of the action and there's sort of been this culture of whatever happens you're going to get a financial gain especially if you're in government or if you have connected if you're in connections you know one of the things when you talk about the electrical grid and the electrical company which was called Prepa it's a subsidiary right it's publicly owned by the government of Puerto Rico and so so the governor any governor of Puerto Rico could like assign a political appointee to run the utility company, which, I mean, if you think about it, that's just, <laughs> it's, I mean, that just leads to a lot of problems. Right. But fast forward to 2006 when, when the 936, like, tax breaks start going away and you're, this is pretty simple, you're spending a lot. Right. Companies begin to start leaving. You're still borrowing. If people are starting to leave. You're still borrowing. And then we get to this massive debt crisis yeah, uh, probably like, you know, 2012, well, 2013, 14. Like, that's where it gets all right. That's, so that's when that, that timing is really useful, I think. So you've got the 936 sort of tax break, which is a sort of like special tax inducement for American firms to, to relocate and to do business in Puerto Rico. You start right. phasing it out in 1996 on a 10-year sunset. T 2006 is the end of that. 2007 is peak housing bubble, but the beginning of the financial exactly. crisis. And then exactly. it's financial crisis. Like, exactly. that's a real double whammy. And then exactly. on top of that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I mean, there's something a little similar to the Greek situation, which is what happens in Greece is both the Greek economy and the Greek budget are not in great shape, but their right. sovereign debt is trading as if it's interchangeable with other EU debt. Yes. Puerto Rico has a similar relation with the U.S., right, where it's like— right. In some ways, there's a way in which Puerto Rican sovereign debt is being priced in that the U.S. government will backstop it. 
this is why I love being a journalist and a political journalist and not a financial reporter because <laughs> it's flipping complicated. Yeah. Because I think they make it complicated in a lot of ways. I've attended a couple of like conferences that were in New York, you know, where the governor of Puerto Rico, the former uh, Alejandro Garcia Padilla, who was a pro Commonwealth governor, like he was speaking, was at the height of the debt crisis and what are we going to do now and how are the feds going to help us? And I remember like there were bondholders there and there were like, financial experts and i'm really trying you know i'm like super eager journalist like puerto rican journalist i'm really trying to understand how this restructuring is going to help sort of this wealth inequality that even though like when we talk about the 70s and the 80s the wealth gap starts definitely beginning to separate you know sectors of puerto rico and i think the political elite was always like, oh, we're going to take care of our own, but like, you know, the poor, eh, whatever. And I remember like asking these financial guys at, at this conference because I was really trying to be like, okay, do they understand the consequences? And I'm like, well, you know, like this is going to close schools and it's going to end services, whatever we, whatever happens. And it was all austerity, austerity, austerity. Like there was no soul or compassion. And that's the part where I wrote a piece in 2015 for The Guardian <laughs> the headline was great. And it's actually my NBC Think editor, Megan Carpentier, who used to be at The Guardian. Now she's at NBC Think, and she's amazing. And she wrote, uh, the headline that she wrote for me was, it's like politicians think Puerto Ricans are dumb or something like that, but they created the debt crisis and we know that. And it really spoke to this level of corruption and complicity with the United States and with financial interests and how we've allowed it as Puerto Ricans to happen and how a lot of people have profited off that, you know, venture capital firms and hedge funds and people in Puerto Rico. That's where I was like, wow, this is really going to be like a mess. Yeah. And what's going to happen? And then that's when you start getting into uh, the PROMESA legislation that um, that eventually became bipartisan that was signed by President Obama that created a fiscal control board. And at the time, there was a lot of people in Puerto Rico even the governor of Puerto Rico right now, Ricardo Rosselló, who were vehemently against it because guess what? It kind of looked like colonialism again. So let's talk about the aftermath of PROMESA and that fiscal control board right after this. You've got this weird situation. And so the legislation that's signed by Barack Obama sets up this bizarre entity, which is the, f it meets in New York and it's in Spanish, it's called a junta, right? <laughs> Someone yeah, told la junta, me this. which is like, if you think about it in Spanish, it's like la junta. Yeah. You know, it's like a bat, you know, yeah. that, can you get something more imposing? Yeah. Of, you know, you start thinking of images of, you know, caudillos and dictators, and it's right. like la junta. And when the board, what's interesting is like, um, at the time, because there was a Republican majority in Congress, right, with Obama. Yep. Basically, what it comes down to is, there were four Republican appointees and three Democratic appointees on the board. Uh, some are Puerto Rican, some are not. <laughs> I mean, there's, I think, uh, and they basically came down and they're like, okay, we're going to help you run your finances. And I will give Rosselló credit on, on this. Ricardo Rosselló, he, he was one of the people who was like, when he was running for governor in 2016, he wasn't for it. Right. And so La Junta brought back some bad colonial memories and it kind of reminded Puerto Ricans that yeah we're not really American you know when people say like oh Puerto Ricans are American citizens I'm like no we're not we're second class we don't have rights and here we go again and then you they go to these meetings Chris and, and and some would be in New York right most of them and some would be in San Juan and they're trying to be transparent and they're like dealing with like pensions and school closings and the fact that the government spends too much and, you know, you can't have holiday pay. Like in Puerto Rico, it's like a culture. You get, you know, you get like a Christmas bonus. It's like no Christmas bonus for you, which is like, what is this, Scrooge? Like that's the part where you're like, come on. And they were very, uh, you know, and especially when you had non-Puerto Ricans on the board, they would, I remember one of them in a report was talking about, well, they, you know, Puerto Ricans can't work. Like their work ethic is not as... um not as strong. And you're like, wow. Okay, we're just we're just going back to like 1898. And so this was happening, and Rosselló is trying. And then September 20th, 2017 happens, which is Hurricane Maria. So you've got the devastation in Maria, 
you've already got the conditions of the fiscal oversight board, the debt crisis, the right. fact that you have essentially like an austerity junta that meets in New York that is essentially <laughs> has a kind of veto over your budgetary restraints, right? That's making very drastic cuts to state budgets. You've got this Prepa, which is a utility company that is extremely dysfunctional and a sort of locus of corruption with local politicians. And you've got Rosseo. So that that sort of gives us enough, I think, context to bring us to like the doorstep of now. So let's just just explain to me what is happening on the island now. <laughs> Why are people in the streets by the hundreds of thousands telling Rosseo to resign? Well, it, there's a history of corruption in the administration, which <laughs> I could use any administration in Puerto Rico. And I think the quick answer is like people when when they're asking him to resign. They go to this sort of group chat, a telegram chat that after a certain time, they, they would start to get leaked. And then I believe like two Saturdays ago, or I'm trying, I've already lost count uh, of when it was, the Center for Investigative Journalism, which is like one of the greatest journalistic organizations in the world. I've, I've been working with them uh, for like five, six years, publishing their work. Uh, they're just amazing. They published the entire 889 uh private telegram chat with Rosselló and his associates and members of his uh, cabinet that show just, you know, homophobic language, sexist language, uh, death threats against uh, San Juan Mayor Carmen Yulín Cruz. Uh, I mean, uh, just to be clear, uh, really dark and disgusting jokes yeah, about her it was death. Awful. They're not, they're not, yeah. they're not joking. Him, it's like, her. I think like right. the, so, so, so the, the, the junta representative for the government, Christian Sobrino, was like, oh, I'll take a gun and shoot her. And Rosselló's the administrator of the, of the group chat. And he's like, yeah, that would do me a favor, dude. It was very frat boy yes, I mean, they yes. also went after, like, Melissa Mark Viverito, who's a former New York City uh, City Council uh, president, yeah. uh, the speaker. And, you know, they called her, like, um, a whore. And it's like, I we got to, like, beat her up. And so th there's a lot of sexist, like, It's real gross. Language. It's I mean, I've only seen highlights, but it's so it's, it's 900 but, pages of linked transcripts of basically they're like yeah they're kind of like fratty broy group chat yeah where they just yeah. talk shit about people and say exactly. really vile shit about everyone <laughs> but at the same time there's also not only that this is where it gets problematic is that they're also discussing government business and contracts and social media trolling and they're also threatening journalists and it gets into it kind of gives you a sneak peek of we know that our politicians in puerto rico are corrupt there's a history of corruption Oh, look, there's 889 pages that's proving our point. And it became that powder keg for these protests because one of the, it's not about a group chat. It's about this frustration that people have had, you know, no opportunity, migration, post Hurricane Maria. You know, I wrote about it for NBC, uh, for NBC Think, for News Think about like this was, you know, this was all festering. And all of a sudden, this group chat comes out. A couple, like the full 889 pages comes out like two or three days after two former Rosselló administration officials get arrested by the FBI for corruption charges. So can you imagine it's like, and this, is, this is what, this was Ricardo Rosselló's worst week, which I call. You remember the, the Women's World Cup final, Chris? That was on a Sunday. He was in France. He was literally in France at the World Cup. There's actually a picture of him and Robert Kraft, the owner of the New England Patriots, where I'm like, Okay, why are you taking a picture with a guy who was, you know, <laughs> was caught in a massage right. parlor in Florida? So that was Sunday. Tuesday, the first 11 pages of this Telegram leak chat come out. And they're kind of bro -y and they're kind of frat boy and they're like, oh, boys will be boys. But the next day is when the Secretary of Education, Julia Kelleher, and the Secretary of uh, the Health Insurance Administration both get arrested by FBI's. By, and that's uh, just to by, be clear, that's the U.S. DOJ FBI. Exactly. This yeah. is the federal. This yeah. is a federal arrest. Um, there is a consultant for BDO, the um, the accounting firm. You know, you know. The more you know, BDO. It was like you know, you scratch my back, I'll get you contracts. Give you know, give me public contracts to my friends. Just to just because just, just I think this is a little unclear because it gets hand waved away. Like my understanding of the accusations is that they were using their official positions to steer government contracts to associates yes. and friends. And friends, exactly. Yeah. And and so that happened on Wednesday. And then on the Thursday right after, a second set of Telegram Gate pages come out. And that's when you start seeing that's that's the threat against Melissa Mark Viverito. 
So that's when that comes out and she comes out and, and issues a statement. So people are like, whoa. And then people are starting to find out, wait, there's more. And then after the governor on Friday is like, no, no, this is, you know, everything's false. That you know, I'm doing my thing. I'm blowing off steam, which I'm like, seriously, dude, you're blowing off steam and you're talking about threatening women. I mean, yeah. I mean, I come, you know, when my parents got divorced, Chris, I'm like my mom came back up. She was a single mom. She was a nurse in Montefiore Hospital. Oh, wow. And, you know, like I grew up in the matriarchy. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> I knew how to, you know, it's like. And so to see those those words, I was kind of like, wow. And you're saying you're you're relieving, like you're blowing off steam. That's what domestic abusers say. Yeah. You know, you're, you know, and you're the governor of Puerto Rico and you're doing this at a press conference. And this, I mean, just to be clear, like there's, as you're laying this out, it's like there are arrests of people in the cabinet. Former. They were, they had resigned. I see. I see. Right. Yeah. So, so. And then, then, yeah, there's a lot of steps that got us here. And I don't want to get like to Puerto Rico, like 101, because. But I will say that a lot of local Puerto Rican media has done an amazing job getting to this corruption. And one of the things that we do at Latino Rebels is we try to do it in English. I have someone in San Juan to be like, these are important stories. We need to do them in English. Because I think what you're saying is like, this is universal. Like everyone understands political corruption. Right. So this just didn't happen like overnight. There's been, you know, allegations against a lot of people in Jose Dio's administration about, you know, something's shady. And then obviously because your dad, who was governor of Puerto Rico, like kind of had a similar administration, you know, people were were wary of him. And you have to understand when he won governor, when he won the governor's election, I believe it was like 42 percent of the vote. And it was actually he didn't win. Like he didn't kick butt. I think he won by like 60,000 votes against his Commonwealth opponent. It was a close election. So he does not forward, he does not come in with an enormous mandate or some groundswell of support. Exactly. And then and the thing is, it's also he's a moderate Democrat. And and the best way I can explain it, it's like he's kind of like the Puerto Rican Joe Manchin. OK, like, it, like it's the only way I can put it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I don't know what that is, but I right. probably put, you know, I probably right. put an image of Joe Manchin. That makes um, sense. No, I could. I, yeah, that's but legible. I, <laughs> but then then that Saturday morning, he comes back from France and then Saturday morning, 889 pages come out. All hell breaks loose. By Saturday night, Chris, the Secretary of State, who's sort of the second in command of Puerto Rico, he's not the vice president, he's not the vice governor, he's not elected, but he's kind of like second in in line. He resigned. The representative of the CFO, so- Sobrino, who's the representative of the Junta, the government representative of the Junta, he resigned. The public relations people that he was associated with, his consultants, who actually would have access to the governor's mansion anytime they all like got fired from, you know, all the government contracts suddenly go away. And there's the governor of Puerto Rico. I'll never forget this saying, well, I'm going to change things. And so everyone else is gone except for me, <laughs> which I'm like, dude. So basically you're the admin of the group chat and then everyone else loses a job, but you're still the governor of Puerto Rico. And he was saying, well, I have a mandate. The Puerto Rican people have elected me. Meanwhile, you start seeing protests every day, right? You start seeing them every day. There's these like, amazing images of people near the governor's mansion, La Calle Fortaleza, which is in Old San Juan. For people that know Old San Juan, you know, they're very narrow streets, beautiful part of, of San Juan. And you start seeing, you know, reports of the tear gas, the Puerto Rican police, you know, after 11. There, there's a saying in the last two weeks, um, Chris, that, you know, the Constitution of Puerto Rico, like, stops at 11 o'clock. Right, right. right. <laughs> and, and you start seeing it. And it, and given the history of the Puerto Rican police, I mean, there, I believe in 2011, there was a DOJ report about Puerto Rico and the police and their abuses and the fact that they have to have, like, you know, actual reform and monitors. There's a history. Like, I mentioned the Ponce Mas- Massacre. You know, the police have had of history of suppressing protests. It even happened uh, a year ago in the May Day protest in Puerto Rico. And that was mostly like, you know, leftist protesters. Um, and there was, you know, tear gas used. And did they throw it first? Who threw this? And so there were questions. And you start seeing social media. People are like, did police instigate the protests? So that was happening at night. But then you start seeing actual peaceful protests. And Rosedio continues to like, you know, 
dig in his heels and say, I'm not leaving. So that massive, you know, on Monday, there was a massive march, the largest march in Puerto Rico. I, I don't know how the Associated Press, I hate to be like media critic, but the, the AP said it was like tens of thousands of Puerto Ricans. I grew up literally, I literally grew up off that highway as a kid, Chris. And I've, and we used to travel it all the time. I texted my dad because it's like, you know, when you know, it's yeah, like, you know, yeah. your neighborhood. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, puppy, there's, this is not tens of thousands. I had people on the ground. Uh, we had, we had three or four people on the ground covering. Everyone's like, I've never seen anything like this before. This is the greatest, you know, display. It was very peaceful. It was amazing. It's okay to say 500,000 to a million. It's somewhere in between. The Sunday, this is why I think so many people showed up. And this was all through social media, organic. This, this wasn't organized. And this is people from all political ideologies. Uh, pro-statehooders, commonwealthers, independents, a lot of young people led by women. But on Sunday, when people were expecting Rosselló to resign, he basically only did was like, I'm not running for re-election <laughs> and I'm stepping down from the head of my pro-statehood party. It was kind of like the worst kept secret in Puerto Rico. And I think that almost fueled people the next day to be like, oh, really, dude? Like, this is, all right, we're going to show up. And that happened. It was peaceful until at, after 11 o'clock at night where you see tear gas. I mean, there were images. I don't know how many images you saw, Chris, but it was a war zone. Like, yeah. it looked like, I mean, I was like, I can't believe this is old San Juan. Like, it was, it was hard to watch. And hard to, um, you know, I published stories. It was hard to take those photos, upload them, and be like, I can't believe this is happening where, where I'm from. And while this is all going on, he goes on Fox News and gives this sort of tone-deaf interview and says, yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm still going to stick out here. I'm all about fixing corruption and Medicaid reform and procurement. And I'm trying to fix the procurement process in Puerto Rico. And I'm like, you, I, I, he was so out of touch. So out of touch about it. I mean, he's basically dug in his heels. The 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 you could feel the sort of growing calls for you know him to resign. Ricky renuncia, which is the the hashtag um, that that is sort of been the kind of focal yeah. point of, of social media protest. And the the point you made there before, like there are May Day sort of anti austerity protests, um, protesting right. against cuts against the university that were right. very much mobilized by the sort of like left and and sort of students. This is. This seems, from what you're saying, from all the reporting I've read, from the people I've talked to, this is sort of crossed all sectors of society. It's kind of like mass mobilization. Rosselló has to go. And I guess the question is, like, people are going to listen to this and he will or will not have gone. I don't, you know, like, we're right now, like, as I'm talking to you, the Speaker of the House has said either he resigns or she's being in impeachment proceedings. But yeah. what is the meaning of this political moment? Like, more yeah. than him is, the, to me, the question. Like, this mobilization clearly was building for a long time. There's a lot of frustration with, like, a declining standard of living. The fact 3,000 people died in Maria. People feel like they don't have a huge amount of, like, economic future. There's been mass exodus from the island in the wake of that. There are the austerity and the cuts. There's the corruption. Like, clearly all of that stuff is building up to this sort of explosion we're seeing. And then the question becomes, like, what are the politics of this moment over and above Rosselló? Yeah, that's a great question, Chris, because the way I'm trying to look at this is that I'm seeing an organic movement. Talk, I've talked to so many people about this, and everyone's kind of like, the system is broken. The political system, the way we are organized politically on this island is broken. We've allowed this Puerto Rican elite class that's mostly white, mostly male, mostly privileged to kind of run this country into the ground for the last 40 years. And we've seen the proof, right? We talk about the debt crisis. We talk about, you know, the growing, the arrogance. And I think one of the things about that group chat was sort of this, it kind of proved exactly how that political class views right. people who are less than them. Right, like it, it was just, the worst way that you would imagine what happens in the smoke-filled room. Exactly. Of, of the like elite ruling class of the islands with their hands on the lever of power, the the contempt that they have for everyone that's not in their little circle. Right. And when I go back to like, when we go back all the way to the beginning, when we talk about like 1898 and, you know, when the Americans showed up, there was a group of people who were like, yeah, the Americans here. Yay. And that's sort of always been there. That This is when you look at colonialism and it's like colonizers can't have a system unless they have accomplices. Mm -hmm. And I think the Rosselló 
world. I have to say, I I grew up in that world because it's you know San Juan centric. You know, we go and study abroad. You know, in U.S. schools, we come back, we go to private school on the island. They were ruling it and they were messing it up. And I think people are just so angry. And I also think it's because Maria, they went through hell. People went through hell and back. And and when you talk about the dead, the Hurricane Maria dead, you know, I was one of the reporters that was saying this is the most important story. I was actually on MSNBC like two days after and they wanted to talk about Trump and Puerto Rico. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We're not talking about Trump and Puerto Rico. We're talking about the fact that this death count is low. This is an undercount. I said at the time, I'm like, from what I understand from my sources and people I talked to, there's at least, you know, hundreds that we're not even talking about. And what was interesting about that is like, I pursued that story and we worked with the CPI, the Center for Investigative Journalism. And there was an arrogance by this administration to journalists. They hated us. Yeah. That we would ask tough questions. And that's what I mean. It's like this sort of like arrogance. We're better than you. Like get away, you know, look at our little club and we're going to like take our personal interests and make money off the island and the rest of Puerto Rico can suffer. That's what the group chat is all about. That was sort of like the proof is in the pudding. After that is a big question for me because, you know, because yeah. I don't know where it's going to go. Well, I really the, don't know where it's going to go. That's the thing to me, like, I keep coming back to is it reminds me a little bit of Brexit where they, like, they're in this position where they <laughs> treat, kind of get together a, a majority for one of the six possibilities and they can't get enough people to vote for any of them. Like, yep. at the end of the day, Rocio goes and Promesa is still the law of the land and the board yep. still exists, although clearly reforms to that seem like a necessary demand. In, in whatever comes next. But, you know, my understanding is like there's probably not a strong majority for statehood or for independence. And thus, yeah, you know, yeah. right? Like that, the, the weirdness yeah. of that relationship and the deficiencies it has from a democratic theory perspective, which is like the PROMESA think Act is passed with zero representation from Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico doesn't have a member of Congress and it doesn't yeah. have two senators. And like, exactly. what would it be like if you tried to get, you know, relief for uh, flooding along the Mississippi and Missouri didn't have any senators, right? Exactly. Like, this is the basic premise of representation of self-determination and democracy, which is which is not afforded to the people of Puerto Rico. And yet on the other side, it's like, it doesn't seem to me the case that there's a mandate for a fundamental structural departure from the status quo. Right. And that, and that's the thing. I think there's a lot of reasons like we've allowed ourselves as Puerto Ricans to accept the status quo. And I think it's because once a colony, always a colony. Yeah. You know, when you start having three or four generations or five generations of living under a colonial system, there's a there's a colonial th- thinking. There's a great term because I study Puerto Rican history and, and literature and I wrote my thesis about it in school and I was like really into it. It's a great term from the 30s called insularismo, insularism. Right. Insularismo, which is literally meaning like sort of insular thinking on the island that we're never big enough, that we're never like bold enough, that we've kind of accepted this situation. And what's interesting is I've always wondered, and this is one of the things that I've done as a journalist for for years, and I've actually had a lot of uh, agreement with people that ideologically might not agree with each other. What if we took out the option of Commonwealth. Like, don't give us that option. Huh. And you and you have to decide. You either in all in or the all United out. States. <laughs> all in or all out. Not <laughs> I feel like until we get to that situation, at least from the status question, because I also think like this protest movement is not about status yet. It could be. I don't know where it's going. It's about this system sucks. We need to do something about this. The best thing we can do right now is to get rid of this governor. Right. Look at all these corrupt politicians. If it's not Rosa Yolo, it could be, you know, here's uh, here's 10 other ones that have that have screwed us over. And I think that's what you're going to start seeing and, and you'll continue to see. But it comes back to the essential question of like, are we ready as a Puerto Rican people to either worry about our destiny or saying, OK, yeah, we are part of the United States. Let's do this. But but at the same time, what's missing in all this is that the colonizer, I mean, do you really think that like Repu- there's so you know how many Republicans in the United States are like, yeah, Puerto Rico, should let them go. Right. <laughs> like, they're a bunch well, of welfare 
like right. Well, what's weird? I mean, what's weird about this is sort of the final final note of the politics of this is that the politics in the U.S. are probably inverted, right? So, like, yeah. the idea on the island, if you just are sort of roughly mapping the left right spectrum, is that like independence is a sort of left position, statehood's a right position, and if you go to the U.S., like you hear Democrats talking all the time about the idea of like D.C. and Puerto Rico statehood. I think Tom Perez yeah. even said it the other day, and Melissa Mark Favorito got mad at him, right? Because it's like, no, that's the opposite of our view of the Puerto Rican left. Like, the American left is like, yeah, come on board, Puerto Rico. Like, Well, that's a great we'd, point. We'd I, love to have yeah. you. And the Puerto Rican left is like, no, 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 that's not, our, that's not our position. And then, you know, it's probably the inverse again for Republicans. I don't think the Republican Party on the mainland wants two senators oh, not, from Puerto Rico. Not now. I mean, <laughs> not you, now. You, saw, you saw Mitch McConnell. I mean, right. he was yeah. like, it's all... But, but this is a really interesting point, and, and I don't want to oversimplify the statehood movement because there's a lot of progressives in Puerto Rico who get lost in the statehood movement. Um, so meaning, like you meaning Cros- there are progressives who favor statehood who are, yeah, who are but not but seen as, yeah. Yeah, so like someone like Crosselló is a moderate Democrat. He definitely aligns more, I think, like, you know, rights, right of center. And he's very institutional Democrat. We're still not at the point where, at least from a self-determination standpoint, the independence movement has sort of been uh, cornered as just being like communist radical and we're going to be the next Venezuela. So that they, they, you know, that there's a lot of people in the middle who are kind of like, right. Well, what about workers' rights? What about, you know, racial justice? There's certain things that appeal to Puerto Ricans when they look at politics stateside, but because institutional Democrats have aligned themselves traditionally with the popular Commonwealth party, it's more of an institutional thing. And I actually think that's even going to get challenged hard because when you look at the presidential candidates, they all had a comment on Puerto Rico and some of them didn't call Ricardo Rosselló to resign. And people are like, oh, you're out of touch. And remember the primary in Puerto Rico next year where you have all these candidates, these delegates are going to have to count. It's actually early next year in 2020. So I think this notion of Puerto Rico becoming a political question I actually am very hopeful because yeah, I think, interesting. you know, the the hurricane, the protest, because they led every newspaper. My prediction is there will be a question on the Democratic debates next week about Puerto Rico. But I do think like Puerto Ricans who are on the island, who are looking at this movement, are questioning it all. And I think we have to allow ourselves. This could be our process to decolonialize ourselves. Hmm. But to decolonialize ourselves doesn't mean that we're going to be independent. That's I think a, we have to start having like a deeper examination really of like, you know what I'm saying? Like a deeper yeah. examination of like, what is our relationship with the United States? Do we want it? Um, is re- are, Should we talk about reparations if we're talking about independence? A lot of things that Americans stateside might uh, attribute to other parts of, uh, you know, other issues. I think that's going to start bubbling up in Puerto Rico. Well, if you want a good uh, brief articulation of the inherent frustrations, even rage that is induced by being governed by a government across a body of water, uh, the Declaration of Independence, United States of America, which is drafted July 4, 1776, has a pretty good bill of particulars about what a pain in the ass it is uh, to have folks <laughs> across the water telling you what to do without a proper uh, representation. Julio Ricardo Varela is a co-host of In the Thick. He's founder of Latino Rebels. Uh, he is a Puerto Rican uh, journalist, and it's a great, great pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Uh, I had a blast, Chris. Thanks so much. Once again, my great thanks to Julio Ricardo Varela for making himself available at such short notice and for such an informative conversation. Of course, this story is still moving. If you're hearing this uh, on Tuesday, um, there are bound to be questions about the successor. There are protests about that. So this is a very fluid situation to to continue to, to monitor. We'd love to hear your feedback, of course, here at uh, Why Is This Happening. You can email, although uh, <laughs> I think I think Tiffany is, like, digging out. I just got an email from Tiffany being like, maybe point him towards the Twitter feed. Maybe, maybe just point him towards the hashtag. I'm blowing up her spot because she's not here. But <laughs> I think she may be drowning in all the emails. So uh, you can <laughs> – she's going to absolutely kill me when she hears this. Um 
you can you can uh, hashtag you can tweet us at the hashtag with pod. We got a lot of great when I put out a, a, a question to you. Do you like the intros or not? We got a ton of great response, which is really interesting to see. So I'm going to put out another question. I'm going to start doing that. So I'm curious for stories in other parts of the world. Obviously, Puerto Rico is part of the United States, but are there stories happening in other parts of the world? Um, like, for instance, the concentration camps or re-education camps for Uyghurs that we did a podcast about that you are interested in. Things that kind of, you know, those kinds of stories that they're kind of at the corner, their peripheral vision for your news consumption. You know there's a thing happening, but you don't really quite understand it and would love someone to sort of talk you through it so you feel like you have a grasp of the basics. Let me know. Let us know. Tweet uh, hashtag with pod with stories that you would like us to cover in that fashion. Why is this happening? It's presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In Team, and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here, by going to NBCNews.com/slash Why is this happening?